you can go and, and use those. What's your as, I don't even know. I have no idea. I'm sending the link as an email. All right. So shh. on Thursday, we spent our entire time just talking about competition, and that was a lose-lose interaction, right? Do you remember that? Yeah. Even if you're the better competitor, it's still a lose interaction because you don't get as much resources as you would in, as you would in the absence of that other competitor. Predation is a different type of interaction. Predation is a win-lose interaction. Who's the winner? Who's the winner? Trinity. The predator, right? Wouldn't it be really cool if I was like, the prey is the winner. And you're like, how does that make any sense? I mean, unless we were the ones eating, then we're the winner, right? Because you get to go be with Jesus. But that doesn't happen very often. Humans don't get eaten very often. Uh, predator and then the loser are the prey. And so this interaction is a little bit easier to quantify than competition. Right? Competition, we talked about that if, if two species, two closely related species are gonna compete for resources, they have to partition up the niche, right? Do you remember talking about that on Thursday? And that's because if they don't, one of them is going to go extinct because the other one's a better competitor. So it's basically out of necessity, the weaker competitor has to take whatever they can get and they end up partitioning up the niche and then they change morphologically to uh, account for portioning up the niche. And what do you call that change in morphology? Do you remember that? Yeah. Characters. Character displacement. Predation, this is a little bit easier to quantify because competition's tough. You're like, okay, we know it's a lose-lose interaction, but how much is a particular species losing in response to this interaction? And when we say, bless you, this is something I didn't mention before, but these whole, all of these illustrations of the interaction, win-lose, lose-lose, win-win, uh, I guess that's really the only options, right? Win-lose, lose-lose, win-win. Um, it's all based on fitness, okay? It's all based on fitness. So I'll, here, I'll write that down. This is based on fitness. And so in competition, both species compromise their fitness because of that competition. But it's really hard to, to know how much. This is not hard at all. Okay? The prey, it's not hard at all to know how much that compromises the fitness. If, it, if, if, if some prey item, let's say a fiddler crab, right? So we can bring this back. Okay? Let's say a fiddler crab gets eaten... What is its fitness now? Zero, right? It's very easy to quantify. Doesn't matter what it was to begin with, it's zero now. Okay, the predator, that's a little bit more difficult, like how much does its fitness increase by eating? Well, that's gonna vary. But, uh, so this one is a little bit easier to quantify and um, a little bit easier to tie to what do you see then happening in the prey, all right? So what are some ways in which a prey item can limit predation, right? So you've got something, I don't know, uh, let's say you've got a, a mouse, right? And there's, we mentioned this before, if you are a small mammal, virtually everything that eats other animals is gonna eat you. What's a way in which you can limit that? Yeah. Well, like, well, like I know we talked about, like some animals are able to adapt to kind of camouflage Yes. Absolutely. So that, that is a, a great way of limiting predation. Okay? Develop camouflage. Let's see if I can spell this. Camouflage. Right? So that's one way you can lower predation. You can develop camouflage. And we actually saw that. We've talked about that a little bit already with, you know, different species of small mammals becoming colored like their environment. Okay? So that's one way. We can develop camouflage. Any other ideas? Come on, you know some. Um, Let's thinking about, I mean, you're, you're gonna find corollaries uh, in, in, in more familiar animals. You're like, I don't know much about small mammals, except when they enter my house, I go and buy traps. 
but I buy have a heart live traps because I don't want to kill them. That's me. And then I put them in somebody else's backyard. My dad, when I was a kid, my dad would catch mice in our house and then he would toss them over the neighbor's fence. It was like a, a year long conflict with the neighbor. And so he'd catch the mice and then toss them over there. And I'm like, Dad, there's nothing preventing that mouse from just coming right back <laughs> into our yard. Plus, it's like, you're going to get in trouble for this, but he never did. Anyways, all right? No other ideas? Yeah, Emma. Okay, yeah. So just hide. Right? Find something to hide. You're not really camouflaging, you're just, you're hiding, right? Okay. Warning call? War warning call? I don't know that. Yeah, when we were talking about the Belding's ground squirrel. Yeah, I think I'm sure we'll see that. So we'll call this out the predator. <laughs> Whoa. Is that right? I should look so wrong. Right? We can out the predators. So this is like, this is work as a team. Work as a team. And then there are a few more. Yeah, Kyle. You could run. You could run. <laughs> Absolutely, you could run. And this is, uh, this is where you see, like, say with, with, uh, with the leeks and the hare, which is kind of uh, almost, I mean, it's like the textbook example of predator prey, and it's, it's in our textbook. Uh, lynx and hare, the hares, which is sort of like a rabbit, but the hares that are going to do best and make the most offspring are those that are going to be best at outrunning lynx, right? So over time, the rabbit gets faster. Well, it's not a rabbit, it's a hare. And then uh, the, the lynx that do best are those that are going to be best at catching the hare, right? And so over time, the lynx gets faster, and you have this, this arms race. Mark? Um, like defense. Okay, defense. The porcupine or stuff. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Need more space. Okay, lower predation, you can defend yourself. So this could be, you know, you, you develop really cool features like the quills in a porcupine, or this could be like a giraffe when a lioness is trying to eat it and you just kick it in the head. Yes. <laughs> Trinity. They're like so when like the porcupine like shoots out from the, 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 the um, is it like a certain number that they can shoot out so they don't shoot them out? Well, they don't shoot them out. They just, they, they are released if something tries to bite them. Yeah. Are they attached to them? Yeah, they can't, they can't shoot them. But <laughs> that would be really cool. That but, scary. yeah, but it can be, I mean, it can be dozens or hundreds, depending on how, how much, how much area you interact with. Rick, were you going to give us another? No, oh, yeah. I don't know. Okay. Well, you could, like, make yourself not appealing to the like, yeah. 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 Yeah, just, I mean, they're, they're a modified hair. So they would grow them back in the same way, you know, I do. I would if I stopped shaving my head. All right? All right. Another way shh, is you could look scary, and we call this mimicry. Yeah, Kyle. Is that um, I think so. There's no E? Oh, man. Okay. No, it is not how you spell tasty. Man, that was pretty passive aggressive there, Kyle. Like, Coach, is that how you spell tasty? All right. Shh. 
So you could look scary. And uh, this is this is called mimicry, and we'll talk about two different types. Um, also, another area under look scary is called apo. Aposematism. Aposematism. All right. This is a pretty good list of ways in which you can lower predation. Because remember, if you get eaten, your fitness goes to zero. So there is enormous pressure for you to lower predatory pressure in some way. Okay? Or... If you are having offspring that often get eaten, enormous pressure to just have a whole bunch of them. So even if most of them get eaten, some of them will survive to have their own offspring. Okay? So again, this one's it's a little bit easier to quantify the cost of predation than competition. And it's a little bit easier to see how you could try to lessen that. It's a little bit more difficult to think about how we can lessen competition. I mean, other than like partition up the niche, you know, displace your characteristics to avoid competition. Other than that, it's, it's tough. This one's a little bit easier. Okay. Any questions here? There should be one. You're like, what is a post-somatism? Yeah. What is a post-somatism? Oh, that's, that's a wonderful question, Rick. Thank you for asking. Thank you for asking. So a post-somatism is bold colors. So apo Somatism. Bold colors. So this is like the opposite of camouflage. This is you really stand out. Bold colors and it usually, use, well, there's no E there. I want to add an extra E. Usually goes with poisons. Or something else. So usually the the individuals that have this aposematic feature, this really bold coloration, they also make poisons so that the predators, they're really easy to find, right? These are really boldly colored. They don't look anything like the environment. They're very easy to find, but it doesn't take predators long to learn. It's not good to eat it. It is not good to eat it. Butterfly, right? Yeah, the, uh, the monarch butterfly is that way. Um, well, you usually don't die if the birds eat a monarch caterpillar, because if they die, that's not helpful to the caterpillar, right? And you're like, how is it being eaten helpful in any way? And you're like, that's a wonderful question, unless we think about all of fitness, right? All of fitness, because if you get eaten, but your close relatives that look a lot like you don't, because the predator learns that they're going to get sick, if they eat monarch caterpillars, now you yeah now you you have some way to explain that really weird idea. Same thing. Were you gonna ask about that? I was gonna ask if like that's the idea for like snakes. Yeah, a lot of snakes are that way. Yep. And you're like, what eats snakes? A lot of things eat snakes actually. Other snakes, birds, uh, small, <laughs> not not small mammals, but medium sized mammals. Oh yeah. I mean. Oh yeah, snakes. Yes. All right. So are there any questions about aposematism? Did you want to ask a question, uh, Isabel? You're just stretching? Yeah. Emma. It's about okay, it's about snakes. How does their jaw extend so gross? How is it impossible? Because they, they, have, they have reduced bone, uh, reduced bone, uh, sca wow, reduced skeletal features in their jaws and a lot more connective tissue. So like our jaws are very, have a lot of bone and very little other types of connective tissue. And in snakes, they're, they're a little bit less bone and more connective tissue, a lot more flexible. And some snakes can not just unhinge it here, but it can also unhinge it here as well. So it goes like... Yeah, so it can go wide and big. Yeah, it is really cool. I'll show you a video of it before we leave as well. Tori. Um, so, what was I going to say? Dogs, they have, like, 
Don't they like swallow their food whole? They don't. Yes. Like, and then it like their body like breaks it down. Yeah, a lot of animals swallow their food whole because they don't have teeth, and so, or if they do have teeth, it's just for trapping prey. It's not for chewing prey. The the problem with chewing is there are few animals that can breathe when their mouth is full of food. Mammals can do it. Uh, crocodilians can do it, but most animals can't. So it, if, if you can't breathe when your mouth is full of food, you can't really chew food. So you've got to swallow it whole. So, but like, if you swallow something whole, can't, like, fight back and, like, sure. back up? Sure. Absolutely. Ooh, yep. Animal. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. So another one that we came up with was mimicry. And there are two types of mimicry. There's... You can look like something dangerous. You can look like something dangerous when you are not. You are not. Right? So that's one option. You can look like something dangerous and you're not dangerous at all. And you call this Batesian mimicry. You see this in a number of flies that look like bees or wasps. They're not dangerous, they can't sting, but they look like bees and wasps. There's also in the textbook, it's a picture of a caterpillar that looks like the head of a snake when it flares out a part of its body. Another option is you can look like something dangerous when you are also dangerous. Let's, let's say it this way. You can look like something dangerous like you. That's kind of a weird way to phrase it, but it works. Okay? And this is called Mullerian mimicry. Okay, so this is when you have a number of animals that are all dangerous, that maybe they all make poisons, or they all sting, and they all look alike. Okay? It's win loose Predation. All right. Any questions about this? So we're going to do a lecture break. We're going to go back to the, our m and data from Thursday. I gave away the M&Ms, so I don't have them anymore. Um, but we're going to go back to those data, and we're going to finish our discussion of chi-squared, and then we're going to talk about one other aspect of community ecology that you can do with those data. Yeah, Tori. So you say that predation is really loose and the winner is the predator. Yes. But in, like, wouldn't the prey be the winner in some cases when it uses things like the human uh, potentially, if, if it actually lowers the predator's fitness, but that's unlikely. Because even if it's poisonous and it's got this bold coloration and the predator gets sick, it's usually not going to lower its fitness. It's just uncomfortable, right? Right? It's uncomfortable to be sick. It usually is not going to have an impact on the number of prey that the predators make. Now, if they kept eating it, it might. But if they learn fairly quickly, then it's still the prey that got eaten that was boldly colored, it lost. Its fitness is now zero. Um, and the predator still got a meal, although it got sick. Yeah, Isabel. So is competition is negative-negative? Yes. Competition is lose-lose, negative-negative. Why is lose, that lose-lose? Negative. Lose, lose, this is um, win-lose and it's kind of the same thing. Um, well, there's still, there, there is competition between the predator and the prey, but they're not competing for resources they're competing for the, the right to survive, oh, okay, so. right? And so the predator gets a, gets, a, gets a meal out of it, mm -hmm. which it depends on to carry out all of its life activities. So, so for competition, it's because um, they're competing for the same thing, and so they're like getting each other. Yes, so that even if you're the better competitor, there are still less resources than there would be in the absence of that competitor. Yep, absolutely. Any other questions? Okay, let me pause this. And then if you would be so kind.
Let's do this. So we have we have a couple more shh interactions that we need to describe. The first one, so we've already talked about competition and we've talked about predation, right? Competition is lose-lose. Do you agree? Yes. Predation is win-lose. The next one is herbivory. <laughs> And, and how do you think this, this relationship goes? Win-win. Win-win. Win-win? Win-win. win-win. Does, the, does, does the grass win when it's grazed by a cattle? By a cattle. By a cow? I don't know. I would thought that we had the lose-lose and win-lose. I thought we had a win-win. So herbivory is just like predation, except for it's not an animal being eaten. It's a plant being eaten. And so in the same way that we built this table of ways in which you can lower predation, right? By developing camouflage, by defending yourselves, by aposomatic coloring, by mimicry, you'd expect plants to develop some of those to fight off herbivory. Okay? Like, well, yeah, but I mean, they eat. They eat animals, and so that's what they're doing. They're not really... Anyways. But, like, maybe, like, developing poisons so you're not super tasty. Right? How do you develop a poison? That's a wonderful question. We'll, we'll get to there when we talk about mechanisms of evolution. Okay? This is a different question. We're just talking about, like, how do you deal with this? We'll talk about, like, how do you generate new features in a bit. Yeah. Um, so, since this is the same as the other one... Uh, Yes, I mean, it, it functions basically exactly like predation, except there's, there, you can be severely grazed upon and not die, right? Where if you're an animal and a predator eats three quarters of your body, you're going to die, right? Unless you're, unless you're a sponge, right? And you can re just regenerate what you lost. Or say you're a sea star and a predator eats two of your five arms. You know what's funny? So, so you know, we farm, we farm oysters and mussels and clams. And sea stars like to move into those farms and just, you know, feast on those, on those animals. And so, for a long time, the farmers, they would go around, they would collect the sea stars out of there, and they'd cut them in half with a hatchet and throw them back into the water. Little did they know that when you cut a sea star in half with a hatchet, you've just made two sea stars. And so now, instead of having one sea star eating your animals, now you've got two. But it, it takes a little while for it to regrow that. How do you kill them? How do you kill a sea so, star? Uh, I mean, you, you, it's, it's, it's not easy. I mean, you, you've got it, you've got it, you cut it half twice. So they have the middle part, it's called the central disc. And if, uh, if you have less than about 20% of the central disc, you won't regenerate. So you'd have to cut it into like, you know, 10 pieces. You know, you could put it in like a wood chipper. <laughs> that, that would work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, that one, like, I'm pretty sure this exists, but it's like a rock that when you, like, step on it, it, like, shoots up poison and, like, kill somebody in an instant. Okay. But, like, why? A rock? It's a rock. It's like a oh, a rock fish. Okay. I didn't think it was rock fish, but it is. Oh, All right. Yeah, Mark. Um, <laughs> like, I, like, I'm like, like, extremely tired at the moment. So, like, do you think I'll be able to like, stand right in the back? And, like, feel like if yes. I, like, if I don't stand up, I got to fall asleep. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Michelle. Oh, yeah, you could do that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you eat them, right? I mean, not the whole thing. Eat it? A sea star? Yeah, but you only eat certain parts. You don't eat, like, the outer covering. You eat the insides. It's like when you eat an urchin. You've never eaten an urchin? Oh, you've got to eat urchin. You've got to eat urchin. What does it taste like? It tastes like the ocean. It tastes like just taking a bite of the ocean. 
Like no, but I've had urchin and I've had sea cucumber. Urchin, uh, it's like a spiky ball. I'll show you an urchin. You've eaten urchin before. I'll show you. Uh, I'm pretty sure. All right. You can eat puffer fish, but it has to be prepared very carefully. All right. So, shh. bring it back. Bring it back. Gosh. You guys. Well, they're not all the same. Relax. So we've got parasitism is a win-lose. The parasite is a big winner. Host is not. But the difference is between parasitism and predator, uh, predation is that the, the host usually doesn't have its fitness go all the way to zero. Right? You can have a parasite, and it's going to feed off of you, but it, it's probably not going to kill you. Mutualism. Now, mutualism would be like uh, coral and the dinoflagellate that lives inside it. You know, did you all know that coral are photosynthetic? They take sunlight and they yeah. use that. But it's not because the coral are doing it. They're animals. They aren't photosynthetic. They have dinoflagellates that live inside them that are photosynthetic and they feed the coral. And then the coral provide protection for those dinoflagellates and give them some other stuff in return. So mutualism. So that means like in deep, like really deep part of the ocean where there's no light, there's no coral? There's no, there's no that type of coral. Oh, okay. There are other types of coral that aren't, that don't have the dinoflagellate mutualism. This is a win-win. So they're not all the same. I know you were concerned about that, Isabel. They're not all the same. Mutualism is a win-win. Both species get a fitness benefit from being involved in that interaction. Yeah. That's like the alligators with the like, And then, and then the, the little, yeah, the little birds or fish or whatever teeth. clean their teeth. So yeah. Eel it's so beautiful, right? Or, uh, you know, you'll have, uh, you'll have, uh, gosh, you'll have some crabs that will place animals on their back, like urchins or other anemones, and they, they both win. Or, uh, Nemo, right? Clownfish and anemones. That's a win-win. That's a mutualistic relationship. The clownfish get a safe place to live. And you're like, what do the anemones get? Oh, they clean. It's, a, it's a wonderful... Yeah, they keep the anemones clean as they feed. The anemones actually get some of that food. Don't like whales. I'm sorry. Mark. Um, I, I, I never see like, those rhinos, those little birds on the Yeah, the cowbirds. Yeah. Yep. You had another question, Isabel? Uh, just that whales have, like, something on their... Barnacles? Yeah. yeah. Barnacles, this is this type of relationship here. Wow, you guys, this is an interesting day. It's like, one minute, we're, like, almost falling asleep, and then the next minute, we're like, man, this is awesome. It's like something caught fire, and you're all stepping on it, trying to put it out. <laughs> it feels a little bit, yeah, have you seen the movie Up? Yeah. You know, the dog, and it's like, squirrel! You know, it feels, today feels a little bit like watching the movie Up. I dress up as a guy from Elvis, Ethan dress up as muscle. Alright, so, commensalism. Commensalism is a win, no impact. Okay? It's not positive, it's not negative, it's no impact, okay? Commensalism. So one species benefits from that interaction, the other species is not impacted in any way. Barnacles on whales are a great example of this, okay? The barnacles get a free ride as the whale feeds, the barnacles get free food, and for the most part, they do not bother the whale in any way. They're just taking up space the whale's not using anyways, right? It would be selfish of the whale to not allow the barnacle to ride there because it doesn't need all that space. Yeah, Trinity. Um, so for like all these, isn't it like a predator and prey, like, um, so yeah, it's like a species and other people. It's not predator. Yes. Yep, 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 yep. Predation, predation is predator prey, and then competition is not. I mean, herbivory, you could sort of think about it as predator prey, but it's eating plants instead of animals. Yeah, Mark, and then uh, Tori. Is that my phone? Yeah. <laughs> this is Dr. Engel. 
She is. Okay. She, I think she knows because she's packing up. <laughs> All right. Yep, you are very welcome. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Okay. Yeah, Tori. Okay. Oh, I keep forgetting. Okay, wait. So. Oh, oh, okay, right, right, right. So isn't there some kind of when the whale gets too covered in barnacles? Like sure. Yes, and there are some barnacle species that do harm the whale, but that's fairly rare. Most of them are going to be in this category. There are some parasitic barnacles that actually feed on the whale's tissues, and so they start to break down the whale skin. That's not great, right? Mark? Um, why would the barnacles want to ride the whale? Um, I don't know if they do. They just settle there. So barnacles, their larvae are free-floating in the water, and then they settle where they settle. Sometimes they settle on rocks. Sometimes they settle on whales. Sometimes they settle on turtle shells. They just settle where they settle. Any any solid substrate is good enough. Yeah, Emma and the Trinity. Okay. So, like, I saw this video of these three whales, like, jumping simultaneously. Uh-huh. Like, the whale was saying, it never happens. Why is that mean? That the, that the, because it's just an unusual behavior. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> Trinity. Why am I supposed to be impressed by this? <laughs> what does that mean? This? Yeah. So these three types of interactions are all examples of symbiosis. Sim, this root right here, means together or with. And then this is life. And so this, these are very, very intimate interactions. These tend to be long-term interactions, right? You get a tapeworm, that tapeworm can hang out for decades, right? That is a long-term interaction. It's not like, you know, a predator. It's not like a lion eats a human being, and then that relationship is very short-lived, right? These are long-term relationships. That tapeworm is feeding on humans for a decade, for years. Carrie. You answered Okay, Michelle. Uh, so I just have a question uh -huh. for the whale. So I heard that the sperm well is like the sperm is in your hat. Is that true? That the, I'm sorry? The sperm is, is uh, in your hat. Oh, that's not true. No. Yeah, that's not true. Okay. Yeah. Um, that the that in a sperm well, it carries its sperm in its head. Oh, no, okay. but they do. The sperm sperm whales are, are very interesting. Well, what? Well, We'll, we'll talk about sperm whales another time. What's that? They are the deepest divers of toothed whales. Yeah, of toothed whales. Yeah, but there um, there are types of seals that dive actually deeper. Anyways. So is a baleen whale not considered a toothed whale? Correct. That's a different type of whale. Facilitation. Facilitation is the last type of interaction that we're going to talk about, and then I'm going to give you uh, some observations and give us an opportunity to make some predictions. So facilitation is either win-win or it is no impact and win. Okay, Facilitation is either win-win or it's no impact and win. Somebody tell me what facilitate means. Because often in this class we've seen words and I'm like, in science this means something completely different. But this one is not one of them. This one actually means the same thing. Let's see who, uh, you're, you're, you're bowing out. Tori, Tori, you've given us a lot. Let's let Rick take okay. this one. So, so this like we give stuff away. Give yeah. Stuff spread it out. You spread the love, right? And so if you are a facilitator, let's say you're a basketball player and you are a facilitator, it means that you're really good at creating shots for your teammates, right? You're a facilitator. You're facilitating your teammates. You thought I was gonna go football with that one, but I'm not, I'm going basketball, right? If you are a facilitator, or let's say volleyball, right? There's some volleyball players in here. And you're a facilitator, you, maybe you're the setter and you're just setting up people to destroy the other team with spikes, right? So you're a facilitator. You're, you're making it possible for other people to have a great game. Okay? In biology, facilitation, it's the same idea. You are making it possible for other species 
to have a great game, okay? And so facilitation, you usually see this when like, say a plant will move into an area right after a forest fire, right? A forest fire just kills everything. And then a plant moves in and gets the soil ready for other plants to show up or other animals to show up. Yeah. How does a plant move in? <laughs> the, wind, the wind carries, wind carries seeds into soil. Come on, you, you, you got to think big picture here. You're like, wait a minute, I'm, I'm, I'm stuck. I'm stuck on this whole idea of a plant moving in. Like, what does this look like? It's wind, wind blows seeds in, or maybe seeds were there in the first place. Birds bring seeds in, right? Or an animal, it ate a fruit and then poops out the seeds, you know, right in this new area. And you're like, why is an animal wandering around? in a place that just got burned down by a forest fire? It's an excellent question. Trinity. Yeah, so facilitation, uh, we, can, we can think of this as one species prepares the community for another. I'm running out of space. One species prepares the community for another, right? It shows up and it gets the community ready for the next one. Okay, good. We're making good time. All right. From Wednesday to Friday, I'm going to give you a lab to do for homework. Um, so just if you're like, man, all Dr. Ingle's ever giving us for homework is reading, and I'm tired of it. Yeah. I'm, I'm, just so you know, from Wednesday to Friday, I'll give you something new and fresh, and you'll have a, a digital lab experience that you'll do. Isabel. Um, does that say sim biosis? Symbiosis. Oh. Symbiosis. Yeah. Cool, cool. All right. Okay, so does this make sense? Yes. We've got, all right, so that's all of our interactions. Okay, so are there any questions up here? And remember, all of these plus minus, these are related to fitness, which means that they are related to ultimate questions. Ultimate questions. So if you were asked, you know, a question, and you, you, you let's say on some hypothetical exam, that's either going to happen on Tuesday or Thursday of next week, and you were asked a question of provide an ultimate I know this isn't a question, this is a directive, but give an ultimate explanation for coral and dinoflagellates working together. What's a dinoflagellate? The, the, the thing that harvests, harvests sunlight and makes sugar for the coral to eat. And you would, like, you would say, okay, I'm going to talk about this in terms of fitness. And look at this. We have a relationship that describes this, that it's a win-win for both. Both parties have increased fitness because of that relationship. And you're like, how do we know they have increased fitness? Because when you do, when you look at coral with those dinoflagellates, they grow faster and, in, and better than corals that don't have those dinoflagellates. And the dinoflagellates, they, they, they just, they have a more stable um, role in the ecosystem when they're in that relationship versus when they are not. Okay. All right. Um, you know, not necessarily. It could be like right now in this moment, it is increasing fitness. Now, so then you're actually talking about a future impact because if it's increasing fitness right now, what that means is that individual is going to produce more offspring in the future. Okay. Okay. Is this all right? So we can tie it all back to proximate ultimate explanations. Okay. So let's stop this.